It's to make the world a nice place to live. It's to produce attractive landscapes where other people want to live. In contrast to the agriculture we have today that poisons everything around it and drives everybody away. That's what we're talking about, and that's what we should be rewarding farmers for doing. And I get all hung up on, my God, how do we pay them enough for their asparagus to survive? We've got to pay them something for that work. But what about all the other stuff they're producing if they do it right? The water quality, the carbon sequestration, the biodiversity habitat, the beauty of the landscape. That's what we ought to be organizing ourselves to reward farmers for producing and we ought to be enabling to do that. Not saying you just got to make it on the price of asparagus and compete with some that's grown on some you know, vast industrialized farm. So, you know, we, uh, we've been promoting this idea and the philanthropists and foundations and uh, impact investors and all those great people, they always ask you, well, you know, we want metrics, you know, how does this, I mean, is this working? And so, you know, I got, I, we have, we, this experiment has been run, actually, and uh, it's been run in a little place called Vermont. Vermont is a very small place, it's the smallest state in the country in population is 600,000 people, one congressional district. <coughs> Great rural, Burlington, the capital, has 40,000 people. It's smaller than Salina. <laughs> About the same size. In the 1970s, 35,000 hippies moved to Vermont. Yeah. <laughs> and look at it today. It's the most progressive state in the country. Bernie Sanders launched his career as mayor of Burlington. This experiment is done wrong. I mean, I have a farm in western Massachusetts in the Pioneer Valley and up in the Berkshire. That's a more progressive place than Boston. And that's partly, not entirely, I don't want to oversimplify this, because a bunch of people went there and they stayed. They did not all give up and, and go. They might have gone to Burlington. <coughs> and they became social workers and local businessmen. And some of them are still farmers and they're, on, they're all on town boards. And state commissions, and they're running the place. And they're putting a certain kind of people in the Senate of the United States of America, which is the important point of all this, is that it has a political as well as economic dimension. So that 35,000 people went to a rural, beautiful congressional district in, let's say, Pennsylvania, or Michigan, or Wisconsin, right? Do the math here. These are, there are rural districts out there that have been neatly gerrymandered for repossession. There's nobody out there. And they're the most beautiful places you can imagine. They got woodlands, they got farmlands, they got brook trout, they got, they got the whole thing. You put a few farmers out there, support them well, and then you get the farm to table restaurants and all the summer theaters and the brew pubs and the hard cider stuff and all the rest of this. And honest to God, you wait, you take a while, but in the meanwhile, good things are happening, and you've got a kind of transformation in the countryside. And if we're not talking about that, what are we talking about? Okay. And once you've got the constituency in the countryside, then you've got the political clout, because look, progressive values are not going to succeed in this country with just an urban constituency. The country isn't set up that way. Politically. So we need this in the countryside so that you can then reinforce all this with the kind of government policies that it needs to reward this kind of behavior and make other kinds of behavior more difficult. That's what government's about, but you have to win elections. And, you know, progressive has written off the countryside for 100 years. So that's not so good. Um, but again, it's not just the farmers, it's the landscape they create and then the connection to the people who've got to support them. The people who are joining CSAs ought to be buying land. Not just paying for an annual share, but you know, it's five thousand acres out there. Put in some kind of co-op, hire a few farmers to run it with a nice 30 year lease. So they don't have to worry about sinking all their money in, in, into their land and then having to sell that. And their children can't even inherit it. Right? Without wiping out the retirement. I mean, these are real problems of how you get access to land for young farmers who want to go out there and do, do good things with it and support them so they have a fighting chance of succeeding. This is 
it's about. So that's what we're thinking about. Um, <coughs> It's going to require a massive investment on private capital in land with people who want to work for conservation values, want to work with land trusts to protect it, <coughs> want to create that, that kind of work. That's kind of what I have to say. I, um, uh, Severin, I think, will be addressing some of these ideas later on this morning, so I'm looking forward to that. That's it. Do you have any questions? Simple. <laughs> <laughs>